Okay, hello, everybody. Um, so I'm going to be presenting today uh, my work from the last uh, two years and a half, more or less. And I think I will focus a lot on speech intelligibility and in vehicle loudness, but maybe we will not get into head movement. It depends on how much time we have on the session. Um, okay, so... Why is the motivation of behind my work? Is a bit that the the clinical the clinics doesn't reflect sometimes the real life situation, and of course the clinics are very important because they like have some methods to assess uh, on a very precise level, for example the audiometer or other other things to to assess the hearing uh, of the person. But these things sometimes are not reflected in the real life. Uh, well. So basically I was saying that, the, that this is the motivation of my work, that what is assessed in the clinic is very different from the, from the field. And so like, the clinics are very important too, but there will be a point that we need also to go into more uh, realistic simulations. And specifically, for example, the speech intelligibility is only assessed with audio only, and it's actually multimodal. And I put just a picture of a, of a soccer match where the guy is covering his mouth so people cannot read what he's saying. Of course, also the body posture or the gestures might indicate his intentions, but uh, if you cannot hear or lip read, then it's difficult to get uh, the message. Um, on the second topic, this is the loudness perception. I always put this example because it's very clear. So basically, with the same audio conditions, they show three images of different trains, and basically the red train was, was uh, perceived as louder. And this is because it looks like an ICE train. This study was done in Germany and actually in Japan also. And in Japan they had different results. So actually vision affects a lot how we perceive loudness as was demonstrated by Hugo Fast. And also this is an interesting study for other people if you want to work more in this, in this loudness that for example that they've made some barriers on the, on the train and they try to show what happens if the barriers are transparent or they are completely solid. And if you don't see the trains coming back, or so you don't see the object making the noise, it seems that it was perceived louder in this case. And this is the part of the head and the gaze. So basically, the head movement and the and the hearing is interacts a lot. And basically, in the clinics, usually this is not taken into account. And it can be that, for example, there's a, like these two publications that talk about like. Uh, directional microphones that they actually perform well in the lab, but when they go into the field, they don't perform perform well because basically the people is not turning the head towards the the the, vis the source or the visual source. And actually, this also for future generations of hearing aids that they might include EEG. There's already in the market. Uh, I think that you can have hearing aids with EEG, and some also future directions also done in our lab with. Um, with hearing aids that use gaze to steer where you're looking at. There's other presentations that uh, show how, how this can be done, that you can actually get it from inside the ear, the, the gaze. So this is a bit my, my work, or my background is a bit on, on, on visual uh, technologies, and basically it's how do you go from one place to the other, or what are the effects if we are in, the, in this kind of clinical on, audio only, Test, when do we move to to have more like a more realistic or immersive simulations? So what what happens with the perception? And I will be talking about these topics as I said before. Maybe this gaze and head behavior and preference of uh, displays I will not talk about if we don't have time. But I will focus a lot on the first two. And this is a picture I like to. I will be showing all the time that. It's a bit from where we are in the in the laboratory with maybe audio only and no special cues to maybe like a real life situation. And I'm gonna be showing the experiment in this kind of plot. So it's just to have a guideline of uh, the things I'm looking at. For example, I'm looking at like visual cues, visual characters, lip syncing, video recordings, immersive systems. So I will be putting some pictures here on each experiment. So basically these are the, the three parts that I talked before. And the first part it was about the audiovisual also. So I will this is a matrix sentence test, I will explain what it is. Um, basically. And then the second one is the loudness perception, vehicle loudness. So we have like a street and some cars going by and then people rated this. And the last one that's like 
graded out, but it's basically a person listening to different conversations and seeing how this person moves ahead. And this is also a work that's been done by Marte. Um, and basically we try to see what happens when you don't have visual cues and when you have and what happens with the head and gaze behavior. Mm. Okay, so what is the matrix center test? I think that everybody knows what it is, but maybe I will just uh, remind what it is. Basically, in the subject is presented sentences of five words, and for each category, there's like a noun, verb, quantity, adjective, and objects, there are 10 possible words. So in total, there's uh, 50 words that you can have in this test. Okay, and then like uh, you can make list of 15 sentences, 20 or 30, and in total there are like 150 unique sentences that they made. Actually, if you have these kind of combinations, you can have a lot of a lot of sentences, but they just reduced it into a subset of 150 sentences. Uh, question: 15 sentences is rather is it should it be 10 or why 15? This the list yeah. of. No, it's just an example. For example, you can have like... Yeah, yeah, then because if you have 10 sentences, you can have them balanced. Okay, like balance, what balance? That all words in the, uh, in the matrix are used in each list. Okay, in each list. And uh, okay. for each multiples of 10, that is the, so the, the lists normally mm -hmm. are only in multiples of 10. And I wonder if this 50 is just an example or anything... No, it's just, an, it's just an example okay. because we're talking about, for example, well, the, the advantage of the, of the matrix sentence test over other tests, well, the other tests that also have these properties, is that you can do consecutive lists. So it's a test that is useful when you have different conditions and you want to test several conditions, you can have one condition after the other. And the people cannot, well, they learn the subset of words, the 50 words, where they cannot predict which word will come. And obviously, like, if you do a list of, of 10, then of course, maybe all the words come in, but usually it's used to do, like, several, several lists. Actually, the only... Uh, three audiovisual matrix sentence tests, as far as I know. One came out in 2019, in September, and the others in 2016. Um, but I will be maybe talking when I talk about the, uh, the expected results. Maybe. Okay, so there are different strategies to, to record this material. No? One, like they did in, in New Zealand, they recorded the all the material. So the audio and the visual material they recorded because they didn't have the material um, and they recorded together the speaker, uh, the visual speaker and the audio. But in our case, because we know that the, the, one of the properties of the, of the OZA or the matrix and the test is that once you record the material, you need to equalize for the homogeneity of the word. So every word is equally intelligible to the others, and that makes, uh, as for my notes, because it's your thesis, that the um, that the um, the slope of the psychometric function is very steep. It gets steeper as you get like uh, more. Of the words are equally intelligible to others. So there's a work behind behind the recording of the audio material. There's a lot of work and evaluation. So there's like a, a whole process behind it. So we decided to use the existing acoustic information, the uh, existing audio-only test, and record the speaker talking this audio test and use the original audio material. So basically, there was a person. Well, the, actually, this is the original female speaker, and. She was hearing with a three dot signal, beep, 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 and then she, she was hearing the sentence she had to say. So she was hearing three signals, beep, 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 then Peter Kaff, ah, about the dozen, for example, and then she was repeating these sentences. And this was like done uh, three times, for example, per sentence. It was recorded here in the, in the Oldenburg Center. And the good thing that why did we use this method is that the audio signal that we were playing on the ear of the of the speaker was also sent to the camera, and then this way we could synchronize the video recording with the, with the audio that was being played back on the ear. So this way, this is the advantage of this method is that we keep the original uh, also material of the audio only, and this can be compared to other tests. Like if we would do, if we would do, if we would repeat the, the whole recording with the with the speaker and using the recordings from the session, then we'll have to validate this material again, and that's actually quite a lot of work. There's actually a, like the people that did this in the the um, audiovisual in the New New Zealand. It's like a whole PhD thesis to do all these evaluation methods and the recording. What is LTC? 
Uh, this is, uh, I don't know, this is like a part of Visual that is like a synchronization signal that it's sent to the camera. So it's like, uh, it's using the other channel yeah, and it's just like... Uh, I think it's linear time code. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. There's something to exchange the time code between devices or you need to use it. So we wanted to, then out of, out of these three or four takes that we had per sentence, we wanted to know which is the one that's more similar to the original recording, to the original uh, audio, like the original also. And we tried different things. We tried at the beginning, we tried to use the envelope uh, of the signal, then only the, the vowels, so that we took out the, the, we did a low pass filter and we took only the vowels. And then we saw that it was not good and then we tried to use the consonants to have like some, some marks and to synchronize, to find out what is the best one. But actually, what was the best? We, we found that this method didn't work. That it was not like some sentences will be confused, confused by others, and it was not a good metric. And then we found out that this was the best metric that we could uh, get for the moment. And basically, if this dynamic time wrapping function is just like uh, tries to get two signals to see how different two signals are uh, on, on on time and offsets, time offsets. And basically, what we use is this signal from here. We shift it 45 degrees, so x minus y, and then we check the slope. So you have a signal that's equal, this would be a, a diagonal, and then you would get like a, like the, the derivative of the signal would be zero. But if you have this kind of up and downs, then you would get like a, a, a different value, so different. And what we wanted to see how good this is metric, and basically, for example, this from the same signal shifted on time, and you can see that more or less at 100 milliseconds, there's, uh, this, this gets like a 42 or 43 value. And this is with our same recorded sentences and other recorded, recorded sentences. So we make a comparison, and basically, they all fall around like 20, and if you check in another sentence, they go around 50. So basically, from this group of here, then we selected the best sentences. So it was like the metric we used, and of course the the speaker when he was, she was like uh, listening and talking, there are different asynchronies. It can be that there's an offset that the word starts earlier or finishes later. It can also be that it's spoken faster or slower. So it's not just like shifting the signal that you will adjust it. You have to have some kind of uh, metric. That's why we use this uh, dynamic time wrapping. So uh, just uh, yeah. Because I didn't understand it. Um, to the left, you have um, the RMS after the dynamic time warping. Well, this is like the, the one that has been recorded um, uh, in the original recordings, and the one, the best sentence spoken by the speaker in the audiovisual mode, or is it in the audiovisual mode map on each other? So, actually, I cannot tell you exactly about these plots. Because this was done by Frederike, and it was like uh, last week I was checking the scripts about this, and I have to keep going with it. I have to do this presentation, so I didn't have time, and it's something that now I'm writing the paper and I'm going to the, here. But basically, here, I think that she was comparing, like, maybe the three recorded sentences that they were, they were comparing against each other, and then this was compared to the other sentences. But the problem that we use for this. The same means the same sentence? The same the sentence. Same token of the sentence. So this, the same words, but different recordings. Okay. Yes. Different recordings. Right? Yes. So basically, when we use, when we use the, it, it is a different recorded sentences means different sentences, mm -hmm. different sentences, but also different words. Yes, different words. Sorry that the plot is not very clear. But basically, it's like the same sentence, and these are different sentences. Mm -hmm. And then we compare it, and uh, we can see that they're actually different. And we, if we use the other metrics, like checking the envelope or the envelope of the of the consonant, this plot was looking very differently. It was very confused. So here, actually, you can make a nice line. And I also this was uh, computed the same way. This uh, the same metric, so to speak, uh, just on delay on the left side engine. Mm -hmm. So it was just delayed copies, and yes. they, they computed the same metric. Mm -hmm. So this, this, uh, yeah, this is the same metric as here, yes. and this is comparing what happens if you delay the same signal, if the same signal you time shifted. Yeah, so if you time. assume basically that uh, 10 milliseconds is something that is... So the left is the one from Bashkin to Bashkin, yeah. But this no, 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 this is our plot, this is our plot. Oh, okay. Yes. So this? What is then the Bashkin? This is a reference to the offset. 
Uh-huh. So basically, I'm talking about that. Well, this is not a topic, yeah, sure. but I, I will be putting references here, and sometimes, sorry, sometimes uh-huh. they belong to the to the plot, or sometimes not. But basically, uh, they are saying that uh, there's an acceptable delay on the audio and the visual signal. If the audio is delayed from the visual, this delay is bigger because basically, if I see somebody talking from the corner, the audio will get later, mm-hmm. and then I will. I will accept this delay as a, something natural. Okay. But if the audio comes before the speech, then uh, this, is, uh, this delay is usually less acceptable. But more or less it's around, around 100 milliseconds. So that means that uh, by computing this metric as a function of the delay, it tells you what is the, the, uh, what is the limit of the metric that is allowed. Mm, some, not exactly, because actually, if you would have the audio before the, the visual, then this actually should go like a, a steeper. Yeah. It should be more uh, yeah. bigger cost. Yeah, it should be a bigger cost, but yeah. if you find DTV, DTW algorithm is symmetric in the sense. Yes, it's, it's yes. Not so it's not checking this perceptual thing. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. this one is symmetric here. Yeah. Okay, but anyways, if you if you choose the best one of the um, with this metric, then you are way below yeah. 50, right? Yeah, below this. But uh, of course, uh, here's only delay, but we have to also take into account that there's uh, a speech rate, and, uh, well, there's a speech rate that is uh, faster. And we used, actually here I didn't tell it, I think, it's not shown here, that uh, we didn't use the, the signal itself, we used the spectrogram, the male spectrogram on the male scale. So we didn't use the, the signal itself, but we used like a spectrogram. Okay. And this is the experiment that we did. So we had like 28 young normal hearing, and we had three visual conditions, so like the audio only, visual only, or the visual. Uh, we have noise and quiet, open and closed. So noise and quiet is like you hear the sentences in noise, speech and noise, or in, in quiet, so it's like a hearing level. And in open, you have to answer verbally to the sentences that you hear, and closed, you see the possibilities of of the answers that you have, you see the whole set of words. And we did an adaptive procedure, so basically the SNR or the, or the DBSPL level was uh, adjusted so you could understand 80% of the sentences. And more or less this is showing, the, I will talk about this one later because they are actually quite troubling, but basically the SNR was going until it was adapted until you could reach some kind of uh, level. Well, at eighty percent intelligibility. This is a, like another picture, maybe to understand how the experiment was done. So basically, we had four training leads of all the visually noise. So basically, we were seeing the person, and uh, this was played in noise, and then we had um, these nine conditions. So it's uh, quite a lot of quite a lot of conditions we wanted to test, and that's why we did the adaptive procedure, and we didn't do fixed SNRs. There's another procedure you can do fixed SNRs, but then you have to test like five different SNRs, and that would have been uh, quite impossible. So it would have been like five on each of these, but instead we did like 20 sentences for each uh, block. And we had test and retest session to see uh, uh, like the training effects and if they retain the information learned. We separated, actually in the training, we separated half of the people, well, fast, uh, almost like 15 people did the training in the open format and 13 did in the closet format. So the closet format, they could learn the vocabulary much better because they could see what are the possibilities. And in the open set, they just heard and then they had to guess what, what was happening. But the testing on day one was always in closed condition. So you always test yes. So we tested all these nine conditions. conditions. These nine conditions were tested always. Yeah, but for those who um, were trained in the open set, yes, you first also performed the closed set. No. Then if they if they did the open set, yes. then they perform the open and then the closed. These are randomized inside. Okay. Then it's. But if they did, it's also ra- randomized. Inside here, yes. Inside here, it's randomized. But these blocks. If they started with the, with the open, then this, they will continue with the open and they will finish with the closed. So, yeah, okay, yeah. within the closed and within the open, yeah. randomized. Yes. But uh, the open and closed sequence is yeah. determined by the training. Yeah, so for okay. basically it was like open, 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 and yeah. then they close with yeah. the closed. Okay. 
And the same in the, in, the, in, the, in the second date would be the same. But in the second date, there was only one training list. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is what, what we would expect from the literature. Okay, so basically, I would expect that the training effects are greater than in the uh, audio only, because basically, <coughs> well, learning to breathe is like a controversial because there are like publications that say that yes, you can learn, others are not, but one says that you can get familiarized with the speaker because the training was done with audio and visual, you can basically uh, learn how the speaker pronounces the words and what sounds come from there. And also I would expect like a minus 4 to 6 dB SNR improvement from the audio only. And uh, actually it is interesting that the lip reading score, so basically just by looking at the picture, on average is 50% and the people can reach from 80 to 90%. So basically people can understand 80 to 90% of the words just by looking at the speaker. Obviously, obviously there are only 50 words that you can have, but it's quite impressive that the people can do this. Well, it depends on the language and depends on if you have dubbing on the TV or not. I don't know, this, this is in Malay, so this is in a language that I cannot say anything, and this was in Dutch. Yeah, and uh, that was for the digital triplets, was it? No, this is like the Malay and the text data. Okay, because Yamalu says it was about the digital triplet. And yes, and how did the digital Malay and the text in Malay? Okay. Yeah. The, people, the people that did more work on this, there are like six master, master theses on the New Zealand Madrid sentence test. They recorded the auditory visual, but they actually never evaluated it. Or at least I didn't find it. So there are a lot of work talking about the auditory visual matrix sentence test, but they never evaluated uh, the, the test. They only, they are the only, which is actually why we use the uh, original the only because it takes a lot of work to prepare the audio only material. Um, okay, so maybe I will show you the uh, the experiment uh, with lip reading only because the audio is too low. So we'll just do this and we'll do some like maybe five sentences. Okay, who could get something? Dozen? What to do? 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 Okay. Peter? Peter? Okay. Immer ran. Du siehst was ran. Acht. Acht. Acht hier. Okay. Autos? <laughs> no. Okay, so the people, actually the range of lip syncing is very big. I will show you with it correctly this tool. Uh, wait, I will close this. And uh, let's see if we did it correctly. So the word, this one was quite okay. Welcome. And the other was Doris. And we only got those. So. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, basically, this would be the bit the, the, the lip reading only, and it's funny because uh, there's a big distribution. So there's people that got like six percent, and people that got like eighty percent, eighty-four percent. So this is actually a very important fact for the uh, the visual also because it depends a lot on your lip reading skills. I will show you later like the correlation. So the, I was targeting at 80% the, uh, the visual <coughs> test, so audio and visual, but people that just with the visual modality could already achieve 80%. And actually this created, a, because it was an active procedure, so the, basically the uh, speech was getting lowered and lowered, it created like an SNR of 62 dB, for example, in one extreme case. And out of these 28, seven subjects scored below 0 dB SPR, so no sound pressure and also below minus 22 dB SNR. I brought this number here of minus 22 dB SNR because um, according to literature, I mean there's different literature, but according to the literature, more or less it will be the level where speech cannot be detected from, from, from this kind of signal. So this, obviously there's people that do it with white noise and speech, and with consonants or with words or with syllables, but uh, more or less, I think that the, the ratio would be around minus 22, minus 20, minus 25 dB SNR would be the place where you cannot detect that there's a speech signal in, in, the, uh, in the SNR. So, but then it looks that, that it would be better to target 50%, not... Well, if you target 50%, the yeah. people, all these people in here, about 50%, they would just use the visual modality 
and the audio modality would get down until you get like values like minus 62 dB SNR as a result. Okay. Yeah. So these are, yes, it's called. It calls even more, yeah, even more yeah, higher. It's just the other so, yeah, yeah, okay. Question, uh, these um, subjects, um, do you do select them somehow, no, no. or did you just pick random? We just pick them randomly. And even randomly picking people, you get some people who can yeah. do such, because, yeah. uh, for example, at television or at the broadcast, yeah. people talk like this, yeah. because there are people who can read lips so yeah. well yeah. that yeah. they can do a yeah. live transcription. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry, yeah, yeah. but... Uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, it's a very interesting topic. The breathing also is interesting that people don't know how good they are. So this actually indicates that it's like a process that is not conscious, no? It's like you see somebody speaking when moving the lips and you get what they said, but you're not 100% sure. Uh, there's actually a lot of literature talking about this, but for the audiovisual also it's important to know this fact because it will change your results. So basically this is the picture you saw before about the adaptive procedure and I made this line at minus 22 dB SNR and basically you have like some people that actually are falling into this audiovisual range so they're actually using the audio and the visual and they're combining it but you have also a group of people that they are just lip reading they are getting just the lip reading results and it's funny because obviously this, some of the results I'm showing here are after training for lists like uh, 80 sentences so they get better but there was a subject for example that he from the first he or she from the first sentence got below this level so from the first uh, trial for the first 20 sentences he was already below uh, the audiovisual threshold using the close or the open test this is all all the open and close this is mixed here okay yeah is, I didn't is there any Consistent difference because I would assume that mm -hmm. if you have the closed test, you might be better. I will show. I will show in the next slides. I will show in the adaptive procedure. Mm -hmm. Because some information is elderly people are better than the hearing or hearing people. Was the same for normal hearing? Well, basically, one of the things in literature they say that the older you get, the worse you get in breathing. So. So it's just like a degenerative, like the older you get, the worse you are in breathing and then there's this, of, of course, like if you're like a CI patient, or since you were young, probably you develop these skills, but mm, the people that are hearing impaired usually are older population and then to evaluate, these things are a bit complicated, no? because you lose, you start losing your hearing when you're older and, and then maybe your breathing skills have not developed through your, your lifetime. And this is in the... In the quiet, we, you can see here like a huge design flaw that we started at 60 dB SPL and there was like all this line here and they started co to converge after 10 sentences so actually we should we should start like, like 20 or 30 dB SPL and get like something more similar to, to the other for example that at the beginning they just start converging. Okay, so this is um, uh, why did we decide this minus 22? So I had trouble how to decide to work with this data because you have people here, for example, that are like minus 62 and then they shift all the, your values down. So basically, you want to get like a, a nice box plot or like a nice mean and then these people that are minus 62, they just like drop your scores down. So they are, uh, and actually it's not an audiovisual measure, it's a lip reading measure if you fall below this, this range. So some ideas were to take out the subjects, but these are the best lip readers, so actually they are the ones that are pulling down, the, even if they are like at minus 20. And the decision that maybe I spoke with Melanie Zogol, what would be the best, and maybe the best would be to shift these values to minus 22, or the value that we find where the, out, out, the acoustic information is completely lost. So basically there's a person that did this, that so is this detection in noise enhanced, enhanced by lip reading. So basically they had, you could lip read, see the person talking and then they said, can you detect their speech signal? And they showed that it was like maybe between 1.5 and 3 dB less than if you just used auditory. Um, and basically I'm showing here the, all the matrix and the tests and basically this falls around minus 18, minus 20. It's where you actually cannot understand anything. And then I added these three dBs from the from this from this study that they use. I think they use white noise, so it's not exactly the same. And then it would come to this minus twenty-two. 
And actually, ten percent of the data was modified out of the whole data, so it was about ten percent. So it's not a lot of data, but it changes, it, and it doesn't change a lot of your plots. But it just makes more sense to have these values limited as a threshold. Yes. So, okay. I don't know. Understand? You you took ten percent of the data. Those who, who the best lip readers, you instead of eliminating that, you just I shifted the values as if it was so. So you yeah. assigned a value of minus twenty two yeah. decibel to them. Yes. Yeah. As if it was like a um, ceiling effect. And this is the problem that this value is a bit taken from the literature and yeah. So where do you derive this value from? This value is from from basically here. So you are like at minus eighteen more or less, minus twenty. Okay. You don't understand any word. Mm -hmm. And these people showed that if you have the visual part and you have also like a speech masked by noise, you can detect it. 3 dB less than there would be the speech detection. There is literature that is saying, saying, telling you that if you are 50 speech intelligibility, you should go, uh, someone is 8 or 10, you should go 10 dB less on the SNR, and then you would get the, val the place where you cannot detect that there's a speech. So this was the value that roughly I uh, took from different literature, but obviously it's not done with the magic center test, it's not done with the speech check noise, it's not a female speaker. Obviously there's like, a, this number can be discussed a, a lot because it's a number I just took. Yeah, yeah. You know that we have a paper where we measured for exactly the center material speech okay. detection pressure. Which one? We have from Schubert's. 2016. Yeah. Ah, okay. So the speech detection check. Ah, okay. So you could. Yeah, I will write you an email later. But this will be pretty good. Also, okay. we started, uh, started discussing using other measures like uh, some D prime or so additivity of D primes from audio and vision. So all of these kind of measures could also be used somehow. Mm -hmm. um, but do you know which value were you getting? No, that I don't remember. I thought that it's meant that I thought it was a little bit lower, but I don't remember. Okay. But that's somewhere in that area. Okay, so probably we'll use that value and then I will do like 3 dB less because if you have the visual information, you can also retrieve more, you can detect better the speech. That's actually what they were showing in this paper. So the idea would be to put it at uh, speech detection threshold. Yeah. And a bit lower, because you have the visual information that helps you retrieve this acoustic yes. information or detect it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so the all the data I'm going to be showing now, it's uh, removing these values. I have one of the extra slides, what would happen if it doesn't, but actually there's not a big change. If here we are like at 14 point something, it would go like for decimals, something like this. It doesn't change a lot. So basically, I'm showing the training effects. This is very important. Actually, in the paper from the Dutch audiovisual audiovisual matrix center test, they said that they didn't find any training effects. I don't know. Uh, so basically, after all this training, there's like 4 dB, which is quite a quite a big step, and 3.7 for the close set. So this is the open and close set differences. So actually, there's like a quite a jump. And it's interesting that from a different date, so this is a different date, they retained their abilities. So if you train them, it can happen that uh, on a separate date, this improvement of like from 8.7 to 12, so almost 3 dBs is retained from one test to the other. And yeah. it doesn't look as if it would stop there. Yeah, I don't know, it just like went down again, so probably maybe these people just get familiarized with the speaker and start to understand why, how this person is saying the words and gets kind of trained and gets, uh, keeps improving. I mean, I, I didn't run any statistical differences here, it would be interesting to see. I mean, anyways, most people are in an SFR where still the audio is... Is present. Is present yeah. and, and contributes a lot, yeah. because if you're at minus 12, if you go back to your intelligibility functions, this and all the, the uh, different mat matrix services. Ah, this no. No more. No. If you go, uh, yeah, you have the different um, intelligence. This one. This one. You, you have something like 10, 20 percent. Yeah. So rate. basically, yeah. these people are like around here. The German one it is the German one is where. Uh, 
Here is like here. But the female is at 10. So female is not shown here, but female is somewhere here. But actually we're checking at the 80. So if the 80 is here, so all this line will be shifted here. Yes. Yeah. So, but if you assume, for example, yeah. you, have, you present just the audio without the visuals, mm -hmm. at, at the same as an R, you would end up at 10-15%. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that means there is, for those, for example, who have 50% word scoring, uh, um, in, in the visual only, so you have fifty percent from from the visuals, and you have ten percent from the from the audio, mm -hmm. and then the sum would be sixty, but you have eighty. So that means mm -hmm. there is some audio-visual interaction, and I wonder whether we could, for example, using this uh, the prime measures, uh, show this interaction somehow that we get more than just an addition of the scores. But this, of course, depends on the lip reading ability of the individual yeah. subject. Okay, so training effects shown. No questions? So what is the effect on the close? It's like one and a half dB, something like yeah, that. Yeah, like two dB. Yeah, yeah. Oh, which is rather significant, I would say. Yeah, and uh, oh. a big difference. Uh, astonishingly, in the German uh, matrix test, there was no open closed difference for, I will show for, for yeah. um, audio only. So basically here, so basically this is the audio only, open and close, so you see that there's no difference. And also, also your data. So yes, this is my data. The original yeah. one. Yeah. Okay. So I'm that produces that. Mm -hmm. I, se I segregated in this plot, I segregated the people that were trained with the open and that was trained with the closed. So actually this group from here, it's only 30 people and this one is 15 people because I think there could be differences on the people that were trained with the closed and the open. Uh, there's a, I have also extra slides showing that there could be like the people that were trained in closed and then did the open perform differently than the people that were trained in one or the other. But actually, uh, for example, in the quiet I didn't find this effect, so I just grouped them together, all the 28 subjects. And actually it's like strange that there's actually uh, like very big standard deviation. Yeah. So there's a benefit of 4.5 more or less, and in the, and the, in quiet conditions, there's a benefit of 7 dB SPL. So yeah. the training is the, in the visual part. Yes, only training in visual. So we did only training in audiovisual because they also could uh, have the speech if they were not good breathers. Makes yeah. sense because. Yeah. This is what you are not used to, maybe, mm. or many people if you pick them randomly. And then they start using, learning the cues that are easily available, mm. but which they don't use. Yeah. Not used beforehand. Yeah. Interesting. Having a close set makes uh, learning easier. Yeah. Yes, because you have the limited yeah. sentences, so I guess so you are faster. Better, better than others. Yeah. In, in, in that larger, larger, yeah. larger. Yeah. And here you see that the values are cut at that minus 22. You see these values are yeah. cut here, and also at 0 dB yeah. Did they get feedback? No. No, no, they didn't know if they were performing good or bad. I would expect when they get feedback, they learn even <laughs> faster. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so here I made four plots. It can be like a bit confusing if you put them like bam, uh, all at the same time, but you have like the below you have the SRT, okay, these values that I've been showing all the time on this column, and here the breathing score, okay. So I separated good and bad lip breathers according to the ones that could achieve values below the minus 22 or the 0 dB SPM, okay. And what I want to show is that. This is the visual noise closed, so basically this condition is the one that they trained, okay? They train this condition a lot, and you can see that there's a strong correlation with the lip reading scores and the values that they got. But if you go, for example, to the quiet condition in closed and, op and open, these good lip readers are like confused with the other people, so it's, it seems that maybe the people that trained in this condition, then they, they got like this good correlation there, but in the other conditions they were just mixed with the other group of people. So, so uh, is the uh, SRT in this condition, yeah. the quiet condition, still made up with this long initial adaptive track? Yeah. Not, not with a uh, lower starting? No, no, no. So then the, uh, you may have a big bias in the SRT. 
because of the, the starting if you have the conversion the starting yeah. phase. Mm. You have a long starting phase and not so many trials left for the yeah. main hub. Then mm. you have a bias towards um, and I this know. bias may I mean, it can be uh, seen that destroy um, some of the effects that you can but see. It's still 10 sentences, it's a 20 sentence list, right? So yeah, it's I mean, still 10, like more 10 like sentences in, this, in the range of, uh, of the yeah. special, maybe. I might have people, for example, that they would actually start to get better and fall into the lip reading section. Mm -hmm. This could happen, for example. Actually, if I, for example, I think if I did 30 sentences, for example, here instead of with here instead of uh, like 20, 80, 30, there might be people that actually might drop even down and go into the lip reading section, like this happened here also. But this is true, it's a good point. No, but still you have um, probably only 10 sentences left for testing mm -hmm. the SRT80 quiet, which gives you much larger scatter there. Also, mm -hmm. you have the background uh, in quiet, um, it's not a very stable condition. And there we know that the SRTs mm. have larger uh, spread mm. in yeah. uh, um, audio only. Mm -hmm. so could be, yeah, could be. It's just maybe just the effect of the larger spread in the, mm. um, in no. the audio condition. Yeah. So more or less what I want. We uh, had like, well, you put the line is always. Looks more clear, no? <laughs> I want to show that there's like a clear correlation there, and also there in the open set. But here, it's like, so I think more this dispersed. is why we have to look into the theory. For example, if we assume that the the auditory only SRT is always the same, right? uh, then basically the uh, this curve, because the higher the lip reading, yeah, the lower is the SRT. So that means there is some yeah. information contribution from the vision, mm -hmm. which grows with the lip reading score, and which makes basically the SRT lower. And this curve is something I think we could discuss, uh, predict from detection, predict theory. from the detection theory or information mm -hmm. addition of information or something like that. So I think there's yeah, I'm pretty sure there's something around. Yeah, I mean the other, the other paper from like the Dutch sentence, it was not about the validation, it was about these kind of effects. So like uh, more like uh, cognitive scientists and like uh, neuroscientists. Mm -hmm. So um, just, just an yeah. idea, um, basically the problem here is if you have good lip readers, mm -hmm. you don't need to present the audio anymore. Yeah. And um, You're testing lip reading instead of other visual perception. There were also some attempts to introduce something like an, uh, a signal-to-noise ratio in the visual domain. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> yeah, actually, yeah, actually <laughs> there is the other point that you can also like mask the can, blur, the yeah, mouth. You and use different colors to blur the yeah. image or you could add yeah. really noise to it. Yeah. And uh, also use the same idea like in the audio domain that you mm. uh, find uh, to produce a visual which is for many people similar in... Mm. I, I see there a problem also because um, people are so different in this yeah. uh, condition, probably you won't find um, a, signal, a visual signal-to-noise ratio at which many people have the same performance. Yeah. He's actually but, but, what we want to do here is we want to know something about the hearing-related function of an individual, which is uh, speech recognition in, in an audiovisual domain. Mm -hmm. And so the information that a specific individual is a good lip reader is relevant, also with respect to uh, hearing aid uh, provision mm -hmm. and hearing aid function. And it has ne never been basically assessed, and this, basically, this tool allows the assessment of, of uh, basically the, the lip reading ability. Mm -hmm and how to, to what extent people use it. In that sense, it is a very important factor in hearing aid of the assessment of this of the subject and also in relation to hearing aid uh, provision and also a hearing related function in real life. In that sense, I think, okay, you, you, have, yeah, you yes. have this as a result, of course. It, it means that if you reading is uh, ability so good that the audio doesn't matter, and you can still say, okay, I do in addition one uh, just audio-only test to 
check um, all the only the speech reception, but that in, in real life basically uh, it may not be so important in the noise condition <coughs> because this is very good at the beginning. But now we hear you and kind of put fall in respect to that the uh, matrix test has this learning effect. And uh, you have this learning effect on both sides, on the audio side as well as on the visual side. And so therefore you, it, it's really hard to distinguish. Um, because if you extend the training, you probably get more and more people into this lip reading mm -hmm. area. Yeah. And or even improves your audio vision <coughs> interaction. Mm -hmm. And um, But maybe you have as well an extension of the audio training giving some better results. So <laughs> it's maybe hard to, to get this all uh, in, in the matrix test. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that like here plays a lot of like uh, cognitive scientists and like models that you can do with this, like for example, why in noise they have this correlation but not in quiet. Is it the same to live in noise and to live in quiet? Yeah, questions that come there. And actually we have like only we recorded us to the male speaker, we didn't evaluate it, and the male speaker was like a guy that was like 40s, 50s, and had like a beard, and maybe it's also very difficult to bridge, so it also depends on the speaker that you put there. Yeah. And also on the visual conditions. In real life you have mm. maybe not the perfect light that you have there, or people are talking with several people and then they look at you sometimes, but sometimes they look in another direction and you mm. don't know if it works still the same. The yes, speaker there's a paper that looks in another direction. There's a paper about this that is like if you look 30 degrees, if you look 30 degrees away from the mouth, you can still get like the same speech intelligibility. So yeah. I could be talking to you there and I could still be <laughs> But uh, You said the face of the speaker turns yeah, yeah. on the sideways. I think there was also a paper talking about this that if you see it from the side, how it is. Yeah. Um, I have another question to. Blue points are the good lip readers, yes. but they score not better in lip reading than the bad lip readers. So, uh, what uh, is what conditions were used to classify them? So, these are the people that in the other visual tests they fell below zero dB SPL or minus twenty two dB SNR. So visual only. No, like the other in the in this they like this. So I will show you. So for example, these people here are the English readers. The people that scored below this other visual domain. In, in noise? In yes, quiet. in noise and in quiet. In noise and in quiet. So for example, these people that are here in zero, these are the people that were shifted. That were below zero the VSPL. Yeah, but uh, I'm wondering that there's uh, and on one. the right side, if you go more to the right, there are uh, some people who are good lip readers. Yeah, like so guys here, for example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. poor lip, uh, lip readers that do better in the, uh, in the yeah. lip reading, in visual only, than yeah. the good lip readers in the audio There actually was a big range of variation. There was like 20% like standard deviation from the means of this, mm -hmm. like the scores that they get in visual only. Mm -hmm. So you can also be that. They they have like a big variability on the ratings at the end. I mean, I didn't check if the lists are visually balanced, for example, or the words are visually balanced, and that could be an effect also that you have like a list of twenty sentences that they are very easy to read, and a list of another twenty sentences that are very difficult to read. This test is phoneme balanced, but it's not bis imbalanced. So this is the the other point that we are testing. Audiovisual, but the visual part is not uh, language balance in the visual domain, and you can have like big ranges of people. Yeah, yeah but yeah. still, this is, is a, uh, it looks as if you have a specific ability to use audiovisual cues, mm -hmm. other than and that you uh, this does not predict how good you could use visual cues alone. I mean, in the in the in this condition, for example, it's quite correlated the lip reading ability with the other visual. So this the lip reading was always made in noise, so it was like visual speech in noise, and it was other visual in noise. So it seems that in this case it, quite, it correlates quite well. For example, if you look into um, the open set with noise, a 
upper right. Yeah. We have one blue. Yeah, there's blue dot in there. the upper right corner, which means that uh, this person was um, very good at lip reading and quiet uh, without uh, audio information, but very poor, very very poor in, 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 in audio vision. It could also be, for example, that this person was doing the test in closed and then suddenly started the list in open and then yeah. was the first list that he got in open and then he didn't perform well. Some cognitive load involved in doing this at the same time. Hmm. And so it could be that in the lip, re, lip, uh, lip uh, visual only, this person was really good at concentrating on this and what had a good score, hmm. like 80 something percent. Hmm. But when it came to audiovisual perception, uh, the system was overloaded and it, this person didn't use it anymore. Yeah. And so it ended up at an SRT of 8% SRT of, of only minus. Uh, I put this that there is some, some interaction in how people can mm. really use this information. I put this plot as an indication. I'm actually like just like a fitter research, but I don't think I will look a lot into these differences in these kind of four plots. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so like the, the finishing line now is like uh, the benefit is like well respected. So using this technique of dub recordings, it was okay. It was like what we expected according to the literature. So people can use this method to record uh, visual material for audio-only uh, established tests. And the training effect was like 3 dB after 5 lists, it's 2 dB, I think, in the audio-only, so it's not 1 dB more. And the lip reading, they have like a floor effect, so the average lip reading score was 50%, so if you test a different SNRs, there's always going to be like this 50% or like the lip reading score. And there's also a ceiling effect, so if you have an adaptive procedure they, um, they will go and they go over your target, then you get this scores that go below the hearing range. And also you have like the, 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 that there's a big range of other visual scores compared to the audio only. So the audio only, the box plot looks very nice, like well, everybody in the same place, but in the um, other visual it's like a, quite a big spread because of the lip reading abilities. And actually, we did another experiment. We tested the lip syncing from that uh, we are using in the lab, and there was no benefit at all. This <laughs> was a bit sad because uh, we were expecting that at least it would be like one or two dBs, but it was like uh, no improvement. So here you have like the plot with the audio only, the lip reading, and the speech synchronization, and the, and the audiovisual condition. And we started testing this at 50, and then we saw that the people were <coughs> getting the ceiling effect, and then we switched to 80 percent intelligibility. So, this is again the matrix test? Yes, this is the matrix test, it's another experiment. So, actually, these are all the other two. What lip sync then mean? Uh, it's the lip syncing we're using the gesture lab. I didn't know what name to put it. Using these animated characters yeah. with our uh, low delay, real time, automatic lip sync yeah. method. Okay, so not the, the, the dubbing subject, no. but rather the, the dubbing is this one. Yes, so this is talking head, this virtual character. Real time talking head. Yeah, so there was no benefit, which is a bit sad, but it's what it is. And then like the also the if you want to follow it bit, I think that I have like a poster in this world confusion in noise and quiet. So what happens in noise, world confusion in noise, and I think. Uh, maybe I will write something about the differences between noise and quiet and the confusion. One question in these animations, which yeah. information is encoded in the lip movements? Well, that's another talk. Just to have an idea because... So uh, basically it's very simple, you get the spectrogram, the power, uh, the power of the spectrogram, and then you have like, you use the formant in a way, like the vocal track model, so basically you have like, uh, you get this shape, and then you say for A, for example, you will have like a first foreman okay. at 3,000 and the other are like, I don't know, 4,000 and then you have like the E, you have like a drop on the second foreman, you have like first and third foreman are big and then uh, O, it would be like a quite a, an U would be like the first and second would be quite low. So then with this information of the shape of the, of the spectrogram, you can try to guess what positions are, the, are they. And if you have like, for example, a periodic signal, it means it's a vowel, so it's voiced. And if you have like a, like a white noise signal, it's an F or a sh. So in the theory, yeah. it does contain the part of the speech yeah. uh, information, and it could be possible theoretically to use it, but people cannot use it by presenting it in this yeah. way. Okay. Yeah. So it's using the speech. It's, it's, it's yeah. better than uh, the dots movies. 
<laughs> okay, yes, yes. It's related, related to the speed team. Yeah. But it's yeah. not good enough to support uh, audiovisual speech. Yeah. Yeah. And so the, the, the people idea here is now to move on and uh, do another PhD in machine learning. Should get. But did you do also great how natural they find this animation? Uh, no. No. Or you, from your own experience, yeah. could, could you tell it's different to the... But there are, there are two main the issues. Or? There are two main issues. I mean, this was seem that wants to say something. I think it's only the matters in the same study, which is a very good in part study. And they compared it much more, they rated it much better than it was when it's just, just in the side of the Okay, but how does it compare to the real recording? <laughs> yeah, so you see that there was like an issue with this model with the M. M is a, is a voiced sound, but the mouth is closed. And this was always interpreted as a vowel, it was always off, like open like that with the mouth. So, yeah, like, yeah, like a now, like mm, it's a voice sound, and it's just like the, to see it from the spectrogram, it's very difficult that you raise an M. Yeah. So, was the mount? Uh, the mouth opening, was it, uh, so how many parameters were used to control the mouth? Uh, three parameters, the mouth opening, yeah. the uh, lips mouth. inside mm -hmm. for making it OO, mm -hmm. and then you have the lips closed and the one a bit on top to make like a pff, pff sound. Mm -hmm. And that was the three parameters and they are combined together. Okay. So if you make like ah, oh, ah, you make this kind of movement, then not move. Mm -hmm. But obviously, for example, here there's like this model should account for the vocal track length, for example, where the formants, um, there's the pitch of the person. Um, then I mean, it's a rule-based model. It's not like a, it's like hard coded. It's very easy to program. It's like 100 lines of code, but uh, it's like for video games. It's like drag and drop. Uh, you can use a microphone and you can talk and you can see how the lips move. But anyway, I didn't want to talk about this today. Um, you, you told us in, in, in this computer side or in this uh, video animation yeah. um, technology, 16 parameters are used, correct? Yeah, it depends on the on the game engine and what they want to use. But six, there is 16 hmm. parameters. Yeah, so we use three, so it's easy to model these characters. It was like a cheap solution. I did this like in a couple of weeks and then I just took half it because I wanted to have like the person move with a mouth. So it's not something... Uh, elaborated, I would say, or state of the art. Um, yeah, so this is like a paper that's interesting. That maybe I will write about this word confusion, you know, it's quiet. So, what happens with the audiovisual when you put add visuals to the words, which ones are more intelligible than others? And this is the work from Sasha Eulings so that she's doing listening effort in, with the matrix sentence test. And the user is also doing like audiovisual integration with uh, other people, I think. Um, but yeah. If you want to know more about these two topics, maybe you should talk with them. Okay, so this is where I would place them. I will have like the virtual character that is the same as audio only. <laughs> and then I have like the video recordings in the ecological validity system in the matrix sensor test. This is a bit of a rough image, okay? Maybe one comment. Yeah. Um, of course, this is always a compromise if you go to real life situations. Yeah. Um, but now, from my experience, this is just my opinion. Uh, the matrix sentence test really achieves across a very broad um, range of listeners to achieve very similar results. Okay. So it, it, it does not test for um, world knowledge of these people mm -hmm. because it doesn't test if you know much about how sentences are put together. Mm -hmm. It just it tries to sample uh, or yeah, to measure the somehow something related to the capacity of the acoustic channel okay. for, web, yeah. for web recognition. And um, if we start introducing very individual factors, um, for example, some, one would be some very complex language model, but another would be the lip reading um, uh, mm -hmm. recognition Abilities. performance, yeah. Yeah. then you measure two things at the same time. And then you don't know anymore which one is yet. which. Yeah, that's the issue. Yeah. Give it. Yeah. I don't really yeah. Okay, you want to put it in the localization queue. Yeah. I don't know. Now you have metric speech in such results, but so Martin was a study where she looked at the motion behavior. The previous motion behavior is metrics and the videos and then the simulation are on the same line. The videos so and the simulation, so these two. Because now you have to put the image of the. Yeah. Um, 
Cloud video recording as a image of the video character. So this is only the, the picture for this for the intelligent for the for the yes. So this is for this experiment for the visual also. It's there. Yeah, it comes to you know, know. it comes to looking into um, in other motion behavior. You can put the animated characters. On and the this, will later. Later. this will come later. This will come later. Another experiment is like obviously this ecological validity. If you are testing, for example. There was a guy that was talking about like a headphone manufacturer and they were telling that if you put a person with a headphones in the laboratory, they perceive so much little things that they will never perceive in a controlled real life scenario. So actually like you think that you are testing your your headphones here and, and but it's not reflecting the real life scenario where you will not detect the small changes in your in your headphone. So it's not always like this direction it can happen that you also have like testing here that, that, that it doesn't have to be like that you increase in this direction. It's just a, like a like an overview of where we are in these things. Okay, so change of topics completely. Like now we go to loudness perception. Okay, so different motivation. Well, the motivation is always the same, no? The, the laboratory doesn't reflect the field situations. You have the hearing and users complaining about the loudness. And you have that um, in the field, the same volume is, the, a higher volume is perceived as equal in the, as lower in the lab. So basically something that's loud in the field. I, in order to have the same loudness, the field is much louder than in the lab, but it's like, a, uh, work by Smith that they have like people wearing hearing aids, they went on the street, they changed their parameters, they put them on the lab and then they saw how they changed the parameters and in the lab they usually preferred uh, to perceive uh, lower the sounds, so lower loudness in the lab, in the lab, yeah. And actually, this I spoke before about this rule of fast, but about this, that if you have like uh, audiovisual cues, the sounds are are perceived differently than in the audio-only laboratory. That is, yeah. Okay, so it's the same as before. What do we need in the lab to make like the loudness perception similar as in the field? So you can have like 3D audio, massive displays, different technologies. And this is the experiment. So basically we had four different vehicles and then driving, train driving action. So each vehicle was, um, uh, doing 10 things, different things. We have like four, I will talk about the results of the 14 normal hearing, not about the 20 hearing impaired because they have different uh, settings and they use the work from the reporting. So if, if anybody wants to know about the hearing aid fitting and true loudness, go to see the their coating. And we measure two things, the loudness rating and the annoyance. And then we have like the conditions in the laboratory where it's just a screen, a head mount display or a last speaker. And these were like uh, in mono, stereo and stereo, like a 100. 120 degrees. This is just an overview. So these are the vehicles we used and we recorded them with a tetrahedral microphone and a 360 degree camera. You can watch this, these videos online and then we put them so you get a better idea of what's going on. So this is what they were seeing. Okay, there was a car here, there was markers there showing the number they had to write. And then here you would write what is your with a hand or with a hand with a paper. Okay. And here obviously this was recorded with a 360 degree camera. And there yeah, is uh, Matthias. Here you have like a DVSPL meter, and we had here was like a, where is it? I think this black blob here is the tetrahedral microphone, and this thing that I'm using is the wait, is the camera. Oopa. Okay, and you see that the people are sitting in different positions. Okay, and this is the rating that here you have like the. Loudness and the annoyance. And these people have this paper that with these scorings and they could just uh, write it down. These materials are uploaded here. I will try when I write the paper, maybe I don't know, in six months or one year, I will upload the material online. And, and if people want to do different experiments with this, it's, it's also possible to do. 
Uh, yeah, maybe it's interesting to see the sweeper that it had like different actions. So this was the one, but for example, the two. Quite loud, okay. This this car. So okay. These are the driving actions of the three cars. So the the band, the motorbike, and the car, and the super is something else like the brushing the, the, the thing. So at the end, we have thirty six driving actions, and they went from left to right as you saw in the video. So they were crossing, and the people were sitting there in the in the middle of the recording devices. Uh, this is the scale that we used the annoyance and the loudness scale and these are the categorical units is maybe something important to remember that I will be showing this CU so if you don't know what is CU, CU is loudness and it's this scale and it goes from 0 and steps on 5 so from 0 to 50 ok uh, we had a test and retest so we did every action twice for the normal hearing, and this is the score that I got with the loudness. I mean, loudness sometimes is a bit difficult, no? You have like a paper and they tell you how loud is this, so how loud would you rate is this room? I don't know. Or uh, how loud would you rate is like this is scratching on the table? It's a bit subjective, no? But, uh, this we could see that more or less the people were consistent on the ratings of the vehicles and the, how loud they were. And this is the distribution, I wanted to show this plot maybe to see that the, this is the, the BSPL and the stimuli that we had that went from very soft from 60, 55 the BSPL to up to like places like 95 so it was a, like a it covered quite a lot of range but you can see that a lot of the, the vehicles they fall in this like 70, 90 the BSPL area mm. And this is like a, well, it's fitted with a function, and more or less it is uh, this is taken from decoding, um, and it's more or less this kind of the loudness function usually follows this this line. This is in dB hearing level. This is dB scale, so it's different different dB scales, but more or less there's like a shift up to a point with a uh, loudness with uh, like average loudness, like I don't know at 80 or 75, it's usually like shifting up. Shift or uh, curvature? The curvature, I mean, like the line is like going yeah, yeah. upwards. Okay. Yeah, so you have a different slope at lower at the right. Yes, yes. Yeah. Sorry so for the wording. Yeah. Usually, like if you invert, they would get like a line like this. Yeah. yeah. And this is what is the problem by with hearing aids that they have to compensate for this loudness so curve. You see here already is that at high loudness, uh, le uh, high levels where the loudness is high, also high. Basically, the curves are similar, but at low. Yeah, the problem is that here I don't have a lot of data at low. So basically, people were saying very soft for this, and actually, we'll open this question for this yes. in the next slides. Um, so, this is the discussion, okay? So, basically, you have different loudness models that there's like a lot that they go to zones. Zones is the perceptual loudness value that's similar to, uh, I mean, you get a similar scale to the VSPL, I haven't changed so much. And then from zones you have transformation formulas from people from modern work that they say like if you have this sound then it will be rated with this loudness, with this categorical unit of loudness. Um, but what if you include the bicycle, no? I mean the people were rating that the car was very soft, but if you include a bicycle for example, a bicycle is softer than a car, so then the people would probably rate the car a bit louder. So it, it, it depends a lot, this loudness scaling depends a lot of the material that you use in your experiment and that's why I don't want to use too much this, this uh, maybe the loudness models yes, but not these transformational formulas, for example, and like this more or less with the sound scale, for example, transform the, the, um, the car, the, the values and these are like the models and this is what we got. And probably if you would include here a skateboard or a bicycle, all these values would shift up maybe to reach the model. So it depends a lot on the stimuli that you use. And at the end we didn't cover all the hearing range of the person. There was no sound that this was like uh, yes. close to the hearing level. So using this, I, would not, I don't want to look at this too much. Yeah, but, but that's clear for the loudness scaling, so to say you, you, uh, you can only get Quotation mark valid results if you have the yeah. whole range covered. Which yeah. uh, the 
they had or the loudness scale has the property of a rubber scale. Mm. So you are somehow uh, you, you mm. use the whole scale for the limited range of loudnesses mm. or levels that you give to your subjects and so on. Yeah. This is the result. Yeah. 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 Can you say what's the background noise level in that field situation? I think it was like uh, 40 or 50, I don't remember. I mean, it, the good thing is that we can check it on the on the on the video, and then you can look at the sonometer. <laughs> you can check. I don't know. Uh, I don't know which, which was the level, but sometimes there was wind and the trees were moving, so they were like this, shh, this kind of sound. Sometimes there was no wind and there was no moving, so there were actually other things playing into account, like birds chirping, for example. So it was everywhere what happened when you do field experiment. But we were telling them to rate the loudness of the vehicles, so not the loudness of the whole scene. So after there was a, per a person coughing, for example, in one of the videos. Um, so this is the loudness, the, the laboratory setup, as I told you. We have like these uh, three conditions. Uh, we uh, make the same DBSP and levels in the field. This was a bit difficult. There was like uh, two dB up and down differences with some stimuli. So uh, maybe the, lab the laboratory effects or something, I don't know. Yeah. Okay, and the results are a bit disappointing because I would expect that the people rated the stimuli louder in the lab, and maybe they did, but they only did by half categorical unit, and there's like a huge range, and there's no apparent differences from like the going from audio only and using the head mounted display and full immersion, so. It would actually be disappointing these results. I was expecting to see like the head mounted display to be the same as in the field and the other two to be perceived as much louder. But the something we get is that that not everybody reacted the same way to the laboratory. So actually there were like a sh uh, like some people perceived it louder by maybe this group of people here, they sit louder in the lab and some people are a bit below, so it's actually a bit strange. These weren't the same people in the field than in the lab. Yeah? And how did you perform the mix down from the microphone recording? So this was like if you Google this tetrahedral microphone, yeah. there's a package that you can download to a software to make this mix. And basically I use like a XY microphone, so yeah. a 6060, yeah. and then the last speakers were placed in the same place. So actually you could do, I mean, from this recording we could do also first order ambisonics. And we're thinking about doing from the first order ambisonics to up sample it to third order ambisonics so you have like a better image. But I didn't have time to do all these things. So in the end it's an XY stereo Yes, recording. exactly. Okay. Yeah, so it would be like an XY stereo recording. I mean, there was a building on the back of these recordings that maybe was creating reflections also. Mm -hmm. But we thought that the main focus was the car that was coming from the left to the right, so that's why it would make sense and also to reproduce it to, to last speakers at 60 each. It was like. So, yeah? so for the um, pre field, you could calibrate that to have the same sound level, but how about the headphones, the headphone display? No, the, the headphone, there was no headphones in the head mounted display. It was with ah, the. It was always pre field. Yeah, it was always the two last speakers at 60. Yeah. 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 So he used the same calibration in the lab, so to speak. Yeah. I mean, this was like, I wish I had more time to prepare the experiment. I, we were a bit on a rush because they, we did the field experiment in somewhere in August, and then with the lab experiment we did like eight months later, you know, because I didn't have time to prepare the material. And I actually, the software used to reproduce these two is the same, but I used a different software to reproduce this one. And I think there they boosted a bit also the lower, the lower frequency, I don't know. How much, but it felt a bit. It, it just felt a bit higher. But when we measured with the BSPL, it was okay, like one or two dB up or down. But still, I'm not very happy with the setup. Yeah. So, on, on, but on the individual level now, so on the next slide, you see some individual differences in perception. Right? So, seems there is some interaction between the subject and Loudness yeah. and around the pressure in the level field. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. Did you use any kind of orientation for the um, lab or also for the field experiments? It was always on the front. No, an um, orientation in terms of an orientation phase where participants 
here all the simulate a range later on. Mm -hmm. To give them a frame of reference of of like how loud is something? Yeah. Or? Mm -hmm. uh, no, no, no. And give them a frame of the range of not the state no. the no, this was also an issue of the experiment that they started with the car and they finished with the sweeper. Yeah. So they went from very soft to very loud. And you should, if you check out the recommendations on how to measure loudness, this is not, should not be done this way. It should be done like, you should do a sound that are mixed in between, but that they are not... Uh, the next sound is never like half of the scale, something like this. So you have a scale like this, you cannot make this sound and then this sound, you should make like a sound that is in the range on the half of the scale. But we didn't do this in the laboratory. We just wanted, and we thought about this to make this kind of like a mix the simulations and the use car and the sweeper. And, but at the end, these people were in the field. And we took these people and then we put the, them in the lab. So we wanted to keep all the effects of the order and everything. So that's, that, and then I could compare directly how, what did they rate on the field? This. What did they rate on the lab? This. And then I get these plots. And this is actually quite safe because I use the same uh, order, the same, uh, yeah, the same of everything a bit. Yeah. Yeah. In the beginning of the section, you mentioned that the, uh, there are studies which show that the um, yeah, allowance in the lab is typically higher mm -hmm. than outside. Uh, in the real world, uh, but which level ranges did the studies use for the mm -hmm. measurements? I'm not sure. I cannot tell you which level they used. I may have say used the whole range because here you started at a level which I would say it's typically in a lab at least something like medium loud, um, which of course will yeah include a lot of bias to some extent at least for for this comparison. Mm -hmm. But I, I think this in, in, in real life the background noise sets of some sort of reference. Mm -hmm. So they had always this background noise and so yeah, I think yeah, it's not But maybe these other studies, if they have however they have done this included as well lower levels, and the larger differences may occur to the wider range of loudness which mm -hmm. has been uh, used there. So yeah. that's the most of point for them. I have yeah, I have comments there. I mean at the end these people knew what was the stimuli. You could imagine when you were hearing in the audio only, what was this car, what did it look like, what color did it have, because you saw them. So actually, I think that the people were rating how loud is the white car when it is stopped, is this loud. So actually one of the further experiments that could be done on this is take this material and use it with people that they were not there, that they didn't see this, and then see what happens. Because I think that the, the ratings were like, yeah, if you do have the only, these people were in the field and saw the car, the driving action twice, they could say like, ah, now it's coming the sweeper with the brushes, okay. So sweeper with the brushes, like super loud, and then rate this. So it's more rating the action and the concept you have about this than the actual sound perception. Because here you, I would say you have not really an effect, not even on the, on the individual scale. So five category humans are only one different category. Yeah. In, in real measurements, and I think if you measure a loud and scaling with, with a specific level in the morning and in the evening, you will have some difference as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it could be. Yeah. And maybe just to test regions as one significant, uh, statistically significant, but the effect is amazingly small. Yeah, it's like, like, come on, like one scale unit. Yeah. I mean, it's difficult data to work with yeah. this categorical unit because you don't know from middle to loud what is the difference. Did you, you, did you maybe uh, make the um, lab measurements twice for a couple of subjects? In different no, we didn't do tests and we tested different mm -hmm. dates so uh, to get an idea how the spread will be mm -hmm. intra individual to get an idea of any yeah. relevance. One um, option would also be to plug this. Um, but for different uh, ranges of CPU, for example, you say, okay, you make you, whenever you have a, a, a rating of something like below 25, yeah, and then you, you plot the difference. You pull everything that is below 25 and then plot the difference. And that may be different from you know, the data you get from the buff. And yeah, to treat like the categorical unit differently. Yes. That's the thing. Yes, if it can be, for example, that you have a lead minus field uh, is bigger for low loudness values. Mm -hmm. 
than for height could be. Yeah. Yeah. So my suggestion would be to also look at uh, whatever for the different categories, um, mm -hmm. plot this uh, separately, just to yeah. see whether there is an effect of overall loudness. Yeah. On to see what happens. A little let my speed difference. Yeah. But, yes. Yeah, and just two remarks or uh, questions. Uh, was one realization as well the uh, car in quiet? So just staying there, not driving from Yes, yeah, like just on. Just on. Just on, yeah, but not yeah. off. Not off, no. Not off. Because at the end, we were asking them to rate the loudness of the cars. Yeah. And, yeah. and then another idea if you have this specific sounds with a visual condition and just uh, change the level artificially, doing some scaling, yeah. whistle most realistic situation and doing the scaling without any uh, visual addition to see some difference in between these two. Actually, I can tell you that I made a mistake in one, in one subject. I forgot to change the other levels and the other levels were much lower and I saw a difference. So there was a difference when the audio levels were different, that people rated differently. And I was like, oh, maybe it rates the same, but no, it was like... <laughs> Yeah, I was I was surprised by this also because they were like, oh maybe it, there's no effect. But no, it it, it, it mattered, it seemed. At least for this one subject. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, different thing. Have you checked the sound level in the field depending on the position of the subject? And I saw they were seated sitting mm -hmm. in the light and you only measure the yes. sound level in the middle. So exactly. So this is a problem here because the people were like as if they were in the microphones and they were not on the side, and there were actually only two conditions where it was equal for everybody, was the conditions that the car was going by. Because when the car was stopped, for example, there was like a 3 dB SPL maybe difference from the person that was sitting in the corner. And this I, I did here, like for example, you see this, this plot here, you see like there's a lot of distribution of points here. Yeah. You see, and these are like the different positions of the people. So when the people were sitting here, uh, here, for example, when the people were sitting here in these positions, we have this position of the people. So then if the car was here or was here, the sound was different from the people that was here and then from the recording device. So we check the distance from here and then, but in the lab, it was, uh, I didn't compensate for this in the lab. So, so, um, so people who were sitting at the side may yeah. have listened to a larger sound pressure level in the lab and in the field. Yeah. This would explain your higher loudness for the uh, Maybe yes, maybe you should check also the position of maybe the people. Maybe you rearrange these individual points yeah, from the them. position maybe you see. Yeah. I thought initially of just using the passing by, so the 30 and 50 kilometers, but then I reduced a lot my, a lot my data set, so like very small. Yeah. Yeah. And it's also diff yeah, it's difficult because you have like a character rating from here to there. And then these people, for example, if the car accelerated this direction, these people I didn't modify them, but these people I did, for example. So it was a bit like decisions to be made there that are like man-made a bit. Yeah. So I will check this thank you for the for the comment, we'll check the positions of the people. Did you take a drone? Yes, yeah, there's, a, there's a drone video. I asked uh, people, but uh, I don't know, because there were so many people that I get like the data to spread all over. Mm -hmm. I, I don't have the age of the subjects yet, for example. So mm -hmm. like because somebody else has it and I'm asking and like uh, they keep bouncing back. So I guess at some point I will get them when I have time to go after people. Um, okay, and this is like the, with the same order of subjects in the different conditions and more or less you can say that they are like more or less consistent. That if they rated the, the loud, the lab was loud with the head mount display, they also rated it in the other conditions. So it was more or less that if they kept this, this lab effect across conditions, it didn't matter if they were using a head mount display or just audio only. Interesting, well, because it's yeah. different measurements and different. So yeah, I would expect that. Including the test retest already, so it looks like there is it is more than just test retest. I was expecting that I know some people would be like would have like no effects with the head mounted display and then the audio only be rated super high, but it seems that they just kept this. Yeah. Maybe it's really you know, the position of the subject. Yeah, I would say this. Yeah. And here we have like the annoyance. Actually I measured the annoyance also, I didn't talk too much about it. Um, but it's more or less similar and actually it was very highly correlated to the loudness, so I didn't go do too much on that. So these are the results, good and bad. There has two sides. Good, that you can do it for clinical measurements, at least what we found out, that 
it doesn't matter if you are in the lab or in the field, you will get an average similar results, but it's not worth, it's that we don't expect this result. Um, also seems the same with the audiovisual representation, so if you do an experiment with head-mounted display and you have to hire a guy to do it, it's the same as doing it in audio only. So it's actually good for the clinical, but for the, my research, no, I will not get jobs <laughs> if people don't put head-mounted displays in. Yeah. And then there's also like the full research that uh, the age, the gender, actually here I should put this thing of the position of the participant, where they were sitting, and actually there were some questionnaires about the hearing experience, sound preferences, and hearing abilities that they filled up there in German. I have to fetch this data and play with it around a bit. And also these like future experiments, uh, the people that have not been in the, in the field, you know, if they will score similarly or they will have like different scores. I wish I had a bicycle there or skateboard because then we'd have like a bigger range of, of, of sound levels. Yeah. Okay, so back to our slides here. So where do we put them? Uh, put them there because it's all like similar. I didn't put the audio and the audio here. I just put them there because it get the same results as in the field. It's obviously can be discussed and like... Yeah. Okay, so I don't know if you want to continue. I don't know if we have time. Mm, not really, maybe. Okay, so we'll go to the conclusion of that. Of this? Okay, so. So, <laughs> okay. so it's just long story short, we had like a screen, people were moving their head, we had a young normal hearing, elderly normal hearing, elderly hearing impaired. Uh, four people were talking, different conversations, many conditions. We had like cylindrical screen or head mounted display, then we had virtual characters and videos, and audio only. And uh, we basically compared how they were moving the head. This is basically the kind of data that you would get. You have the red signal, it's a target speaker, so there was only one person speaking at a time out of the four. Position that minus 45, 15, minus 15, 15, and 45. And these are the head movement and the UG, so the eye movement. So basically you can see that when they're using the head mounted display and virtual character, they were following the speaker quite well and the head was a bit separated from the eye, so they were not pointing the head directly at the person speaking on the side. So results? And is the, is the oh. eye including the head? No, it's not the estimated. This is the gaze direction. It's the gaze, it's already the gaze yeah, direction. Yeah, it's so compensated with the head, yes. Okay. Yes. So basically you can see that they actually, this is a very nice plot, I put it here yeah, because yeah. EOG usually can be crappy, but like quite close to the target speaker. Yeah. And basically these are other results. So when the speaker was at 45, or plus or minus 45, the head with the head mounted display was turned a bit more, 20 degrees, with a, with a cylindrical screen was like a bit less, like 5 to 8 degrees less. And then with the audio only, they were looking a bit straight or a bit on the side. This would be uh, so. Also, they had like a bigger head range with head mounted display and with a computer with a cylindrical screen, and with the audio only with the curved screen that's what is closer. And here you have like these plots that are related to this, basically showing you that uh, the target speaker is at 45, and when you have like visual information, the head is closer to this 45. TV angle, and when you don't have anything, it's closer to zero. So basically, showing that people were not moving their heads when they were in, or moving very little when they didn't have any visual inform any visual information. And here's the range of the yaw. So basically, the participants that didn't have when they didn't have any visual information, their head was rather still in the same angle. Width than we see video and virtual character. Yes, so this was, was that here. Yeah, sorry, it was that went super fast. Yeah. So that basically doesn't didn't make much of a difference whether you use the character, the video, or the work which yeah, in terms exactly. of motion. Yeah. But the display had some influence, and also yeah. Basically, the problem with the head mounted display is that you have a reduced field of view instead of like a bigger one, one hundred eighty. You have one hundred ten, and then you have to turn the head more towards mm -hmm. to be clear to see clearly mm -hmm. this. I mean. One of the questions is if this actually affects hearing aid evaluation, this uh, degree difference. Maybe not. Yeah. And this is the case, for example, so this is the target here. And you can see that when they were like a video or virtual character, they were closer. And when they were on the, on the only, they were a bit more further away from the, they were not looking at the, at the position of the speaker. Mm -hmm. 
Um, this is the preference. I separate the, the, the elderly and the young, so I ask them which condition would you like to do in a next experiment. And basically, they mostly prefer the video, so they actually, the video card does not have enough quality, or maybe they just like that there's more gestures and facial features. And the elderly prefer a bit more the cylindrical screen. But the young, for example, they had the mixed preference between the head mounted display and the 2D. So, in the cylindrical screen, they didn't care too much if they used the cylindrical screen or the head mounted display. The colors are different. The colors are Yeah, sorry, it's like done very fast. Yeah. Because I didn't know if I would present this, so I went fast. Um, so, conclusions uh, cylindrical screen and the video recordings are better. Well, more ecological, I don't know, because we don't have any tests in the field. So we guess that they are more ecologically valid. And the uh, head mounted displays change the behavior, so they have like bigger turns. And the elderly also might prefer a bit more the cylindrical screen, although they don't reject the head mounted display. So if you have want to test the elderly with head mounted displays, you have to be careful. And that the video recordings are preferred uh, clearly. So we need to improve the visual characters, make them nicer, so they are like a more equal uh, in preference. So the same plot as before, we place these people more or less, and we have like the cynical screen, the amount of display, the videos on the visual characters, and here we have like the, well this is not the room we used, but it's just like uh, nicer to represent a 3D display, 3D audio. Um, so 3D audio is less ecologically valid? Than the rest. In head, in head movement, at yeah. least. Yeah. yeah. But they still we don't have the control real life scenario, the real life situation, so we don't know exactly. But it's according to the literature, you look at the person that you are listening to. So it's quite intuitive, this result. Okay. So the end, I don't know, a bunch of pictures here. <laughs> and this is like the, the end. Okay. Thank you.